elegantly dressed in a perfectly tailored white suit. Prince Bernard of Lippe Beesterveld, consort to the Queen of the Netherlands, brushed past the waiting journalists. I am above such things, he snorted. The stains on his character, though, were becoming visible to all. There was the luxury apartment he'd purchased in Paris for his mistress, a string of dalliances with other women, and the matter of his past membership of the Nazi party. And one more thing, a hammer pounding so hard on his reputation, it threatened to bring the whole edifice down. In 1974, 50 years ago this year, Prince Bernard had secretly written to the American aircraft giant Lockheed Martin, demanding $1.1 million on an upcoming purchase of fighters by the Dutch government. As Inspector General of the Dutch Armed Forces, the Prince had the ability to make or break the deal, and Lockheed complied. Across the Atlantic, the United States Senate's Banking Committee had noticed the payment, as it held hearings to understand why Lockheed was going into its 1975 stockholders' meeting with unaudited financial statements. Lockheed, Senator William Proxima soon discovered in the hearings had paid hundreds and millions of dollars through consultants to government officials in Saudi Arabia, Japan, Italy and the Netherlands. And among the recipients was Prince Bernard. The president of Lockheed, Karl Kotchian, was asked about that payment. He replied, I think, sir, that as my understanding of a bribe is quid pro quo for a specific item in return, I would want to characterize this more as a gift, but I don't want to quibble with you, sir. Less than 24 hours before that hearing, Lockheed's vice president and treasurer, Robert Waters, had committed suicide by shooting himself in the head. Eli Black, the chairman of United Brands Corporation, jumped to his death from a New York skyscraper as the Securities and Exchange Commission discovered that his corporation, the largest American banana producer, had paid 2.5 million in bribes to senior politicians in the Honduras. Hi, and thank you for joining this episode of the Print Explorer. As the United States Securities and Exchange Commission proceeds against the Adani Empire, many in India have been struggling to understand how and why American investigators became involved in crimes that are alleged to involve Indian government servants and an Indian company. I'm very, very far from a financial expert. I can barely handle my own bank accounts. But what this episode of Explorer will be looking at is the extraordinary legislation which underpins all this. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or FOCPA. The act has no real equivalent in history until then. Till 1974, when Senator Frank Church held hearings into bribery by American corporations, Corruption was considered pretty much a normal element of doing business. It's just lubricating the wheels of commerce and industry, many thought. American companies were furious with the move towards FOCPA, which they thought would force them to operate with one arm tied behind their back uh, against competitors. To Senator Church and others, though, it seemed that such a law was vitally necessary to protect and defend not just the reputation of the United States, but the entire architecture of global free trade. For decades before the Great Rebellion of 1857 finally evicted the East India Company uh, from its primary role in India, the greatest multinational corporation of its time repeatedly petitioned the English crown for money. The company's predatory trade forced it to spend on forts and soldiers to fight endless wars against its competitors and expand the frontiers of its trade monopolies. As would ruin England to lose her empire in India, observed John Dickinson, a very perceptive con contemporary writer on India. It is threatening our own finances with ruin to be obliged to keep it. Karl Marx, yes, the same guy who later wrote the Communist Manifesto, and if I may say a far better historian uh, than, than a prophet, offered this analysis. He wrote, there now exists a national debt of 50 million pounds, a continual decrease in the resources of revenue and a corresponding increase in the expenditure, dubiously balanced by the gambling income of the opium tax, 
which is now threatened with extinction by the Chinese beginning themselves to cultivate the poppy. As Marx pointed out, the reason the East India Company managed to persuade the crown to pay for its adventures was pretty simple. The company happily bribed the king and his key aristocrats, while its own bosses, famously foreign uh, Warren Hastings, fed at the trough of the revenues from India. Though Hastings was acquitted of corruption, historian John Noonan notes, he remitted home at least £218,527 during his 10 years in office. That was 10 times his annual salary. And this is how mercantilism worked, right? You paid up a share of your profits for the privilege of doing business. You paid tax to the sovereign show, but also bribed everyone who could stand in your way. Call it a gift if you wish. And mostly the system worked. Elizabeth the first key bureaucrat, Francis Walsingham, was notoriously corrupt, but he was also fantastically efficient, and no one seemed to mind if he made a few bucks along the way. Poverty was for peasants and priests. But then as capitalism evolved and became more structured, this way of doing business became a problem. The principle of capitalism was that markets should be independent entities. A bribe shouldn't settle whether someone purchased product A or product B. That should happen because of the price and quality of those goods. And a bribe shouldn't settle if company A or company B got a contract. That made nonsense of the whole idea of free markets. Following the Great Depression which erupted after the stock market crash of 1929, the business of regulating capitalism became all the more important. The United States Securities and Exchange Commission, the institution now prosecuting the Adanis, was founded in 1934 under the left-leaning President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The framers of the SEC Act argued that there was a close connection between protecting investors and maintaining a healthy economy. The SEC's mandate dramatically expanded from 1937 under future Supreme Court Judge William Douglas, with the organization restructuring power utilities, imposing rules on over-the-counter security dealers, and setting up uniform accounting standards for publicly owned companies. Even though the New York Stock Exchange didn't like this and pushed back, it ended up losing the argument after its former president, Richard Whitney, was caught embezzling from the NYSE's funds for supporting the widows and children of deceased stock exchange makers. William Douglas was able to impose the SEC's will on important stock exchanges across the country. From the 1980s, as what people call neoliberalism grew in influence, the SEC's powers were curbed and it increasingly withdrew from oversight of big financial institutions, a decision that some people say enabled the global financial crisis of 2008. That's another story though, which isn't very relevant here and I'm not particularly competent to tell you. There was something else, though, that would take the whole anti-corruption issue to a whole other level. Late in the summer of 1975, Senator Church's Senate Committee on Multinational Corporations was investigating the sharp rise in oil prices which had come about after the Israel-Arab War in 1973 and the energy embargo which followed it. The committee discovered that Northrop, a very major supplier of military aircraft to Saudi Arabia, had been paying bribes to a Saudi arms dealer, the infamous Adnan Khashoggi. The committee learned of something it called the Lockheed Model, an institutionalized system of American companies paying bribes across the world. To secure the sale of its Lockheed L-1011 TriStar passenger jets to all Nippon Airways, it turned out, Lockheed had made $2 million in payments to a convicted war criminal and right-wing fixer, Yoshio Kodama. Kenji Ozano, a business known, businessman known for his political concessions, and the Marubeni Trading Company, which represented Lockheed sales, were also involved. The code name Peanuts was used on receipts to indicate payoffs. Tokyo District Public Prosecutor's Office later arrested former Prime Minister Kakue Tanaka on suspicion of violating that country's Foreign Exchange and Foreign Trade Act. It was the first time in the history of Japan that a person who held the post of Prime Minister had been arrested for a crime committed during his tenure. There's still lots of conspiracy theories around what happened to the effect that the United States wanted to go after Tanaka and fix him, 
And I'm sure you'll hear plenty of similar conspiracy theories in India now. To understand why all this happened, you have to go back to 1972, when operatives working for President Richard Nixon, who was then engaged in his uh, election campaign, were caught burgling the Democratic Party's headquarters at the Watergate uh, complex in Washington, D.C. The famous Watergate scandal I'm sure many of you have heard of. Now, Watergate was... At first glance, a straightforward case of political espionage, one party spying on the other. But Senate investigations into it led to a network of illegal campaign contributions made by top American multinationals to Nixon. One of those corporations, Gulf Oil, provided an incredible account to the Senate committee that detailed on an elaborate overseas network to siphon political bribes back to the United States from other countries. Gulf had apparently distributed more than $5 million to various influential politicians. Following its investigation into Gulf oil, the SEC sent questionnaires to US companies and asked them to reveal any questionable payments made by them abroad. Based upon this survey, the SEC published a report showing that over 400 US companies, including 117 who were in the Fortune 500 list, had made questionable payments, totaling more than $300 million. The legal scholar Mike Kohler has written a riveting account of the debates which followed. Even as many diplomats and corporate leaders argued that they were being pilloried for universal business practices, you know, greasing the wheels, others argued that the costs far outweighed the benefits. Representatives Robert Nix and Representative Stephen Solars the latter, by the way, a very important friend of India over many decades, argued that American bribe-giving was ending up empowering Cold War enemies who cast America as a rapacious predator. Large corporate interests, they argued, were also undermining America's major foreign policy goals by providing cash that kept unpopular corrupt regimes and rulers in power long past their sell-by date. In essence, they suggested corporate interests were in the pursuit of their own benefit, undermining America's national objectives. Senator Proxima put the case against bribery thus. He said, the payoff may cost a lot of money and still not work. You are paying off people who are dishonorable or they won't accept the payoff. You may be double-crossed. The payoffs, while deferring the pressure for a while, may cause bigger problems later on for obvious reasons because of the illegality involved. The senator closed by saying it is bad economics as well as bad morality. Now, I should say here up front that I've never been engaged in any kind of business negotiation in my entire life. And I'm not going to offer an opinion on whether Senator Proxima was right or wrong, whether you can do business without paying bribes or you can't. The truth is, however, that amid concerns that multinationals were subverting America's democratic values and its free market principles, his supporters won the debate. The State Department and the Defense Department resisted any unilateral ban on bribe giving but were overruled by the political leadership. There was also an effort to suggest that there could be some kind of voluntary disclosure system for overseas bribe giving, but this was also shot down. Finally, in 1977, President Jimmy Carter signed off on the FOCPA. This was, it's important to understand, not just any other corporate regulation law. Fundamentally, FOCPA sought to institutionalize American free market principles and values across the global trade system. There have been a string of legislative interventions to strengthen that structure since, notably the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, which mandated rigorous practices of financial record keeping. In essence, this body of legislation makes a very simple point. If you want to play the game of global capitalism, you'll have to play by the rules or risk a very sharp bop on the head by the umpire. Of course, these rules haven't eliminated corruption, very far from it. But if you do get caught, 
there are consequences as some companies across the world have been discovering the hard way. Two key ca- cases help us understand where things might go in the Adani case from here on. In 2016, the Brazilian firms Odebrecht SA and Braskem SA, who are very big players in the petrochemicals and construction sector respectively, agreed to pay $3.5 billion in fines to settle their ongoing SEC cases. The two companies, uh, prosecutors had alleged, ran a kind of actual corruption department, a proper department uh, of the company, which paid out hundreds of millions of dollars to corrupt officials in Brazil. The funds were sent from the companies to politicians, political parties, and even the state-owned petrochemicals giant Petrobras, which then gave these companies various kinds of favors and concessions. Later, the supermarket giant Walmart and its Brazilian subsidiary were fined $137 million, again for paying bribes to Brazilian officials. In this case, Walmart was accused of using third-party intermediaries, basically subcontractors, to bribe officials to obtain the permits necessary to build and operate its stores. These practices, it turned out, had become very commonplace among Walmart subsidiaries in Mexico, India, Brazil, and China. In India, the SEC said that Walmart subcontractors made, I quote, improper payments to government officials in order to obtain store operating permits and licenses. These improper payments or bribes were then falsely recorded in Walmart's joint ventures, books, and records. According to an article by corporate lawyers Andrew Reeves, Pamela Reddy, and Neil O'May, the United Kingdom has also been cracking down on violations of its Bribery Act, which is even more stringent than FOCPA. Last year, gambling giant Entain announced that it had put aside £585 million to cover a potential settlement over alleged bribery offences regarding its former Turkish business, which was called Sporting Bet. And last year, the UK arrested Romy Adriana Rosa, the chief of staff to the president of Madagascar, for seeking a £225,000 bribe from Gemfields, which was a UK mining company that was uh, trying to get licenses to operate in Madagascar. Former Nigerian oil minister Dezani Alison uh, Madueke has also been charged with receiving hundreds of millions of pounds in payoffs for contracts and properties she is alleged to have purchased with those payoffs in the UK and the US have been frozen by investigators. Few believe, of course, that these kinds of cases are a very significant uh, deterrent against global corruption. Uh, After all, members of drug cartels take the enormous risks they do because the lure of enormous wealth far outweighs the risks of getting caught. For every one criminal put away, many, many, many get away with it. Like I said, again, I should repeat this yet again, I'm far from a financial expert. The ins and outs of the Adani case are well beyond my realm of knowledge. But there is a law enforcement function, I think, that's very important here. To function efficiently, economic institutions, just like our streets, our politics or our communities, need to be regulated by effectively enforced laws. The option is anarchy, and the next step from anarchy is violence. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act isn't just some kind of naive exercise in morality. For all its limitations and problems, and it's an important assertion of the principles that allow free market economies to function in the first place. I'm Praveen Swami. Thank you so much for joining this episode of The Print Explorer.